Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that's very profound. A lot of us usually have a lot of fun when we're perhaps sitting at the restaurant watching our children doodle on the kids' menu, simply trying to find their way through what is known as the labyrinth. On the program today, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about is the labyrinth. The book is Dancing at the Edge of Death, and on the program today, I'd like to welcome Miss Jody Lorimer. Jody, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. It's my pleasure. Now, tell us what this book, Dancing at the Edge of Death, is about. Ooh, 25 words or less? At least. <laughs> uh, very basically, uh, I originally was inspired to write it. Well, it, 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 I didn't intend to write it, but it just sort of happened that way. I was curious about the fact that there was a report in the paper about um, these Episcopalian ladies walking a labyrinth as a meditative spiritual exercise. And I, my background, background is in anthropology, and I've studied a lot of mythology. And from where I stood, I understood the labyrinth to have been the prison for the minotaur, who was a half-bull, half-man, cannibalistic beast. And I didn't understand how that would square with it being a spiritual exercise, a peaceful Sunday afternoon pursuit, and began to just do research to discuss discover what the origin of the labyrinth actually was, and I couldn't find the answer to it. Nobody, nobody seemed to know. They just said, well, it goes way back there in time, and we have no idea where it came from. So as I began to explore more deeply into the idea of it, um, essentially what I had to do was to combine what are two, in our modern way of thinking, generally thought of as two wildly different sides of um, the brain, essentially, the spiritual side and the scientific side. But those things needed to be combined together in order to understand what the labyrinth represents. And it is essentially a spiritual journey, but it's also a neurological component of our natural human brains and has always been that way since the Paleolithic, since the first modern humans. Now, uh, labyrinth and pay. Paleolithic. You have that as a subtitle, The Origins of the Labyrinth and the Paleolithic. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> it's, yeah, the, on the one hand, again, uh, the people who uh, are more interested in the spiritual side of things see Paleolithic, and that reminds them of college or high school, and you know they think science, and it doesn't pertain to them. And on the other side, um, the scientists think, well, you put a labyrinth in the title, and that automatically puts it on a New Age bookshelf. But there are essentially two sides of the same coin. Paleolithic just means the Old Stone Age. And there are different eras in the Old Stone Age, but my focus is on the Upper Paleolithic, which is about 20,000 years long. And it's an ancient prehistoric era that marks humans' development of the first stone tools and essentially represents 99% of human technological history. An elaborate can mean lots of things. Most of us are just are familiar with perhaps the sharp design of a labyrinth. Um, it has different perspectives depending on how you're looking at it. If you're inside of a labyrinth, as you hear in, in mythology or literature, uh, and you have this circuitous path that goes back and forth and back and forth, maybe in a corn maze or if you've walked um, you know, a labyrinth in England, you don't really have a sense of how long it is or where you're going or if there's a center or if you've gotten there yet. And so it can be kind of frightening, kind of um, you know, confining and claustrophobic. But if you stand back and you look at a labyrinth from above, it's very harmonious. It's a very beautiful pattern, and it's very intricate and, and very lovely. So it has, a, it has a paradoxical aspect to it. Now, it's interesting because we talk about trying to navigate our way through the labyrinth, and I mean, I remember even growing up, you know, you're penciling through these puzzles, and they're quite fascinating a lot of times when you think you're finding your way, and then all of a sudden you end up trapped. Now, tell us about the significance of the labyrinth, as you say, a spiritual journey, uh, how that could actually get us to tap into our deeper selves. Um, well, there's a, there's a distinction that, that needs to be made, um, and that is the difference between a labyrinth and a maze. Mm -hmm. 
uh, a maze is, is, you know, we would get those books as kids, as you say, and, and try to find, you know, the path through, and then you'd run into a, a wall, and you'd have to go backtrack and find another route, and then maybe that would be another false lead. A labyrinth um, is different from a maze in that there is really only one way in and only one way out. You can't get lost, although while walking one with walls, you may feel that way, or even one that's flat on the ground, you kind of go, well, am I ever going to get to the center? It goes on and on and loops back and forth. But essentially, you can't get lost in a labyrinth, and the purpose then is the journey itself. It's, the, it's a personal journey that takes you into this circuitous, essentially mind-altering space that, like any repetitive motion, kind of puts you in a different state of mind, into a receptive, more uh, aware state of mind. And uh, as you get finally to the center, then um, you have a, a, the sense of, okay, this is, this, is where I, <laughs> this is where I was headed, and then it's easy to find your way back out again. Uh, the modern labyrinth movement, which I discovered after years of studying this topic, is really quite huge uh, and international in scope. Um, they train people to use a labyrinth as a spiritual tool because it's essentially a, a, a microcosm of a, of a personal journey. You begin at the opening of the labyrinth with stating an internal intention of why you're there, maybe what you're opening yourself to, what you would like to receive in terms of information or help or guidance or just peace. And then once you reach the center, it gives you a chance to kind of process the journey so far. And as you move your way back out again, you've come to some sort of resolution or, or uh, a, a settling of your spirit that says, okay, I kind of know where to go from here. I think what's really fascinating as I was thinking about this book and uh, reading through it is uh, back in the 1980s, there was a movie actually titled Labyrinth, if you remember. I don't know... Uh, uh, oh yeah, with David, uh-huh, with Bowie. David Bowie. Yeah, and I remember it was actually quite unique. You know, here she starts on the journey, thinking this whole thing is a piece of cake, but at the same time, this labyrinth keeps changing on her. You know, it's mm-hmm. almost though as if it's alive. And she kept saying through the whole thing at times as she was getting frustrated, uh, is that this just isn't fair. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> well, whoever said anything like this would be easy in the first place because you had such a confident, arrogant approach in the first place when everybody was helping you. But then you realize, well, I can kind of do this on my own. And, well, okay, well, what we'll kind of leave you to your own devices here now? But I guess people would actually have a difficult time at times being in a situation like this. Uh, yes, and, and, and as I recall in that movie, I haven't seen it since it came out, I don't think. But if I remember right, they used M.C. Escher designs mm-hmm. when she got to the center. So there were staircases that went up and down at the same time and, and you know, dead-ended and so on and so forth. But if you, you look at uh, almost any, well, true, I think any, um, film or literary um, device, uh, plays, novels, whatever, that have a, a, a sense of a labyrinth in them, the, the point is you, you are launched either voluntarily or you're dragged kicking and screaming on a journey, and the journey tests you. And when you get to the center, essentially what you have to do is confront the thing that is most fearsome the thing that is challenging you. And uh, in the Greek myth, that was the Minotaur. Uh, These Athenian youths were sent into the labyrinth, essentially just turned loose in there to wander around until they, you know, and they could never find their way out, and they were eaten by the Minotaur. But the larger sense of the journey is that life is not easy, it's not fair, and you're constantly on a journey of one kind or another that tests you. You have an illness, you have a divorce, you have some catastrophic thing like the tornadoes that just happened in the South. And you have to work your way through it. You have to, to, to elevate your spirit to be able to confront those difficult issues and come out not just whole, but better, enlightened to some degree. 
you bring up uh, something that reminded me of the movie As Good As It Gets starring Jack Nicholson, and uh, they were sitting in the car talking about how, you know, their lives just weren't working out well. And he says, I don't believe that we're upset that our lives aren't working out so well. It's that we're that pissed that everybody else has it that good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just think that's true. Well, we do, because the truth is you can't know day to day that this life you're comparing yourselves to, you know, um, when things aren't working well for you, is really working that well for them. It just seems that way because you can only recognize the pain or the suffering that you have uh, at the moment. But there really is a spiritual evolvement as you're moving through these kind of experiences. Well, what, that's the point, I think. And if if you're not, then I think you keep having to get hammered over the head with the same lessons until you figure it out. I guess one of the reasons that we have this, this cult of celebrity where, you know, people are just so fascinated by the rich and famous because it would appear that they have everything they could possibly want. And yet, when you dig a little bit into, you know, many of those people's lives, you see how profoundly disconnected they are from from reality. They have numerous marriages. Their children are crazy. They're drug uh, addicted. They're, you know, they just, they're not always happy people. Some are, are perfectly wonderful, creative what marvelous people who contribute tremendously to society. Uh, but I think we have this sense that, well, all I need is more money or a big house or a, or a handsome husband, and everything is going to be just fine. <laughs> the, really, the Cinderella complex. In other exactly, words. yeah, and that's not, not at all the case. Now, there was a, a part in your book that I was really fascinated with, uh, and that is uh, as people try to approach the spiritual, they do so through altered states. And this is something that's pretty much around the world and has been around for the most part in the history of mankind. Talk about that if you could. Uh, okay. Um, what If you've ever been in one of these caves or any place uh, that that shuts out light and sound and so on, you uh, understand the se- the meaning of sensory deprivation. We, humans are designed to take in huge amounts of information on a minute-to-minute basis, second-to-second basis, uh, visually and orally, uh, uh, through sound, through through touch, through you know, all of our five senses are always tuned up to be aware of what's going on. And initially, that was so that you could avoid the leopard that was sneaking up on you and find the right kind of food to eat. But um, what happens when you go someplace like a deep cave? where you're shutting off all of those sensory devices and you, your brain doesn't have anything coming in to work on, to process, it's, it gets bored. It starts making things up. So you begin to, if you're sitting in the depths of a cave with no light, and I've done this um, briefly when I toured some caves in France, and they, you know, it's a big thrill for the guides to turn all the lights off, and everybody goes, ooh. But if you do it for very long, your brain will begin to hallucinate. It will make up images in your head. You'll see light, and you'll hear voices, and you, know, you hallucinate. So hallucination to, well, even now, I think if it happens to people, it's certainly a, it's a, it's a, an amazing experience. And to people then going to these deep caves into essentially these very effective sensory deprivation places, um, those were, it was the spirit world talking to them. It was, it was the cave that was working in communication with them to, um, communicate information about the spirit world or about the land of the dead or the ancestors or whatever, however they defined the other side of this natural life. Our waking life is what we come to expect and we get, you know, very used to it. But then, say you have a fever, you have an accident, you, you um, have surgery and you have to take a drug, it alters your, your um, mental and uh, neurological capabilities in ways that give you information or experiences that are completely outside of your normal waking activities. And then how you come to de- define those experiences determines essentially the, the, the way you see 
the world itself? Is it just a natural consequence of being hit on the head with a hammer that you're seeing spots, or is it something else that is communicating with you from another place, another reality? And that is a universal human experience uh, through as long as there have been modern humans and probably uh, archaic humans as well. We have the same neurology and the same brain as they did, and it's a matter of how we define what those experiences are um, that we come to understand the nature of that experience. Jo- Joan of Arc uh, heard messages from God, and even at the risk of being, you know, well, at the, <laughs> the eventuality of being burned at the stake, mm-hmm. she said, no, these are messages from God, and uh, I'm sticking to it. Now, there's the curious thing, is that sometimes you can get a person that begins for lack of a better word, a crusade saying, I'm here on a message from God, but yet in this path of this message uh, seems to be a conqueror, you know. Um, And this has happened throughout history, especially uh, with the Christian and the Catholic crusades, where here they're kind of wiping out what they consider savage people or indigenous cultures and taking away their spiritual path, if you will, uh, is that part of how a labyrinth works on a grander scale from an individual? Uh, n- no. I didn't think so. No, because it is it is ultimately a personal journey. There's there's no pope of the labyrinth. <laughs> yeah, well, I no say that because that's, yeah, you see somebody who gains that kind of power, and it's like, how can the people surrounding this individual? not see that maybe there's just something a little off here. (laughs) Well, maybe eventually they do. Hopefully they do. But (laughs) I think what you're looking at then is a whole structure, a whole ideology, a dogma that surrounds certain sacred observations and artifacts. So you have, um, you know, years and years and years of people writing uh, books and making rules and uh, punishing those who don't uh, go along with what they consider to be the right way to live. And um, th- where the labyrinth is concerned, it sees, at least in the, and I think this is what gives it its power, well, one of the things it gives it its power throughout all of human experience is that it's ultimately you coming to terms with your own stuff who you are. And in the modern labyrinth movement, you know, there, there are no rules, essentially, except if you meet someone on the path, you nicely step aside and let them go by. The rest of it is up to you. And so the, the thing that I've come to appreciate uh, from, there's a, a national labyrinth organization called the Labyrinth Society that I'm, I'm a member of, and I've been to a couple of their conferences. And these are people that come from absolutely every walk of life. And they're artists, they're writers, they're, they're architects, they're mathematicians, they're reverends, they're spiritual leaders and counselors, but they, there is a marvelous sense of tolerance and appreciation for the differences of human existence and uh, that ultimately it's your choice to make. You're on this journey by yourself. You can't take anybody with you. Now, the title of your book, Dancing at the Edge, how did you decide that would be the title for it? Um, well, it sort of <laughs> came to me <laughs> early one morning, uh, but it seemed, it seemed just right, one of those little things that drops into your brain out of nowhere. Uh, in the Paleolithic caves, there are at least four images of, of bull men, essentially minotaurs. They're, they're men's bodies with bull's heads. And they're, they're painted or engraved on the walls of these deep caves, and they all appear to be dancing. Uh, they all have one leg lifted. Three of them have their arms out in front of them. So it's not as if they're just standing there. They don't, they're not ho- necessarily holding anything. They're, they just appear to be dancing. And they are uh, shamanic figures that is a uh, spiritual practice that is also a universal uh, practice based uh, on the experience of altered states of consciousness, where uh, in a deep trance, um, the shaman uh, moves through outside of his body and into another universe, in, through essentially a vortex. And this is something that's universally reported all around the world, from shamans to modern uh, heart patients who have near-death experiences. You know, the whole going down the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel thing. 
it's exactly the same experience, a feeling drawn, pulled, dragged into a vortex of energy, and then on the other side, uh, as you emerge, you're in the land of the dead or the ancestors, or however you define that other world. Um, and then if you're a shaman, you train yourself to go there on purpose so that you can consult with those spirits or ancestors and then bring information back to uh, the people that you serve in order to bring them healing information and help. Um, so these shamans, as they move into that other universe, they are taking over the power of their spirit helpers. And in many cases, I think this was a bison or, or a bull. And so you see this composite creature. It's the, the shaman who is taking on the power of the bison or bull and, and wearing their head, becoming partly them. And uh, this is, I think, the origin of our image of the minotaur that was degraded by the Greeks into a creepy monster, but in the traditional paganistic religions, it would have been considered a very powerful shamanic figure who had transformed and was bearing the knowledge and wisdom of this sacred animal. So they're all dancing at the edge of death because they cross over that line into death, but they come back. Now, if you can, can you explain how technology may have affected the way we kind of try to get to the source, if it has, in fact, done that? What are you defining as the source? Well, you're talking about being, I guess, in alignment with God, I guess, or the center of the labyrinth, if you will. <laughs> and, and I think this day and age that we can really learn a lot from our ancestors and the way that they lived and the way that they gathered information. Whereas today, you know, you're popping it up on an iPhone, for instance. You know, mm -hmm. has that created a separation, in other words? Oh, ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the the Paleolithic world uh, was so completely different from ours. If we're you know we're talking twenty eight thousand years ago, thirty two thousand years ago is where the earliest art comes from, and it was uh, there was nothing domesticated. Dogs weren't domesticated. Well, there's some argument about that, but you know maybe uh, as late as fifteen thousand years ago. But mm -hmm. uh, there were eons and eons, thousands and thousands of years where these people lived on a par with enormous wild animals in an enormous wild world. And their conception of, I mean, they think maybe there were 40,000 people in Europe, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so huge spaces. And these people had to be very tough, very bright, very determined uh, and very creative to be able to not just survive but flourish. I mean, now we're like a virus, <laughs> so we've right. obviously been successful as far as that goes. But we've also lost that sense of being an integral part of the natural world. And these people, that was, the, that was the, a given. I mean, there was no alternative. They were smarter than a lot of the other guys, but they were not able to, I mean, they only lived maybe to be 40. If they lived beyond that time, it was very unusual. It was a tough existence, and, uh, and they had to kill something on a regular basis to eat. I mean, they collected, you know, vegetable life as well, but they, they were hunters. And it was a very dangerous existence, uh, but there was a belief, and it's a pervasive belief among all hunter-gatherer cultures. I've read lots of ethnographies, studies of, of either existing people or people who were reported on, a study by anthropologists and so on, that if they, they are, their relationship to the natural world is not superior, but they are just an integral part of it, and they all share in the same same creative spirit. They're mm -hmm. all part of and came from, derived from the same creative spirit, so that there is a, a deep respect for everything in the world that they related to, everything in the world, period, rocks, trees, animals, other people, um, because there was that sense of we're all part of this same Uni unified existence, but here now, modern world, we've completely lost track of that. We have no conception of of how the, I mean, a very limited conception of of how the the world works. You know, people have to be taught how to plant a tomato plant and how to, you know, mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily important to kill 
wolves. You know, they they have a natural part of in in this in this uh, world, and then it needs to be respected. So we've definitely lost track of that in a big way. And so we keep building houses, you know, in New Orleans. <laughs> and they yeah. get, you know, they're going to get blown away sooner or later. <laughs> Boy, this really has a lot to add to today's world when it comes to the concept of who am I. I think a lot of times you find people, especially as they approach midlife, this day and age, asking the question, you know, who am I? They really don't know who they are. Here back in the day, you're talking about people that lived to be about 40, or, and, and they were aware of who they were. It's quite a different world this day and age. Very much so. Well, there's, there are too many choices and too many pressures, um, I think, that come from so many different places. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm sure they had their own version of an identity crisis, but I think their lives were, were much simpler, not easier, but just right. simpler. And, um, and it was uh, much more clearly uh, defined, you know, who you were and what you were capable and not capable of doing. And, um, you know, as a, as a member of a small tribal group, you knew exactly where you fit. Now, is there a website people can find out more about this? Yes, there is. Um, it's uh, for my book, so it's uh, Dancing at the Edge. The, there are dashes in between, so it's wwwdancing at dash the dash edge dot com Jody Lorimer thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program fascinating subject wonderful well thank you so much it's my pleasure you bet thank you again and give out your website again one more time it's www.dancing dash at dash the dash edge dot com dancing at the edge thank you very much it's been a pleasure Thank you so much. Bye-bye. We also thank you, the listener, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.com, the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. We thank you again for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.